So the event in which we are about to participate is the second of four events of the symposium Georges Jusena at 100, a symposium in celebration of his life and works, recognizing the work of the Portuguese poet and scholar Georges Jusena. I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Fred Williams, momentarily. But before that, I want to recognize all the people and departments on campus that have made this symposium possible. First, I want to recognize the um, co-sponsors of the event, the Harold B. Lee Library, the BYU Department of Spanish and Portuguese, and the BYU College of Humanities for their material, financial, and personnel support as this event was planned. Within the library, I'd like to thank our executive assistant, Wendy Duran, our administrative assistant, Ava Cecil, Roger Layton, and his team of student graphic designers and library public relations, Eric Howard and his exhibits team, the Special Collections Division for their collaboration, and Elizabeth Smart for her support and encouragement. In the College of Humanities and the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, Dr. Jeff Turley, uh, Department Chair of Spanish and Portuguese for saying yes, uh, as well as the deans who approved the use of funds, and in particular, my co-organizer, Dr. Halling. Um, I also want to recognize here our invited guests from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, Dr. Francisco Cota Fagundis, up here in the front. Uh, he'll be speaking to us tomorrow afternoon at 3 p.m. in this same auditorium. Uh, so just a few items of business and a few words. Uh, first, uh, we had an event this morning, the round table, in which uh, Dr. Fagundis, Dr. Williams, and a number of people, former professors of uh, Portuguese and Spanish here at BYU. Uh, so we had Ted Lyon, Ron Dennis, um, Gordon Jensen, and uh, Hal Clegg. Uh, they participated in a round table this morning that was uh, recorded, and the audio of that recording will be online on the uh, website um, later on this week. Um, now, as a part of Dr. Williams' keynote, he will be doing a show and tell of items he has donated to special collections, as well as a number of uh, books from his private collection. And so when he does his uh, show and tell, everyone in the audience is welcome to come up and look at those items. Um, and in doing so, as you um, look at items from special collections, um, I invite you to please follow the indications of our representative from special collections here, uh, Dana and Scheme, um, in treating these materials well. So uh, don't spit on them or rip them or try to steal them or anything naughty like that. Um, following the show and tell, we'll have a small break, and after that, we'll be watching a screening of the video George Jusena reads his poetry, featuring George Jusena himself being interviewed by a much younger Dr. Williams, as well as reading his own poetic work. Uh, this recording was made only one month before Dr. Sena's uh, untimely death, and uh, Dr. Williams will be explaining a lot more in detail about that that video, and that will that screening will commence at 3:15. Uh, as I mentioned, tomorrow we'll hear from Dr. Fagundis, and in the evening there will be a celebratory event, Food and Fado Night. Um, that's what we're calling it, where we're going to listen to some live Fado, um, courtesy of Dr. Halling, Dr. James Krauss, and Dr. Mike Child, all of Spanish and Portuguese. Um, and we're going to have some Brazilian food, so please uh, come to that. There, there also just might be the possibility of some ping pong. So, you know. It's, <laughs> now, now, now you're going, right? Yeah. So um, please be there. That will be tomorrow evening starting at 6 p.m. in 1141 JFSB. And all of this information is found on the promotional posters found in the library, on TV screens, in the Kennedy Center, the JFSB, in the library, as well as on the subject guide, Georgia you stand at 100, uh, found at guides.lib.byu.edu slash Georgia you stand at 100, and the 100 is numerals 100. So in addition to the events already described, there are two things I want to highlight. The first is a display on George Jusena found on the third floor of the JFSB near the department offices of the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. Um, it's a lovely exhibit, um, has his biography, uh, an exp explanation of his life and work, um, as well as some of the books on display on the reading wheel that is part of the, the display. Finally, if you are interested in learning more about George Jusena, the library has a number of books by and about him that are available for checkout and that are also a part of special collections. Some of these are displayed outside the auditorium here for your reading pleasure, and you should feel free to check them out so that if you just go outside here the auditorium, um, they'll be there next to the sign. 
Um, and they'll be on the fifth floor of the library by the Humanities Help Desk when not accompanying events taking place here in the auditorium. So they'll be here down here tomorrow afternoon at 3. Uh, so with those recognitions, announcements, and business out of the way, please indulge me as I share a few thoughts with you about the genesis of the symposium. In 2018 and 2019, following his retirement from the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, Dr. Williams made a sizable donation of materials to the Harold Bealey Library related to his decades-long work as a professor of Portuguese literature and culture worldwide. Significant among the items he donated was a large collection of books by and about Dr. George Sena, Williams' mentor, advisor, colleague, and friend at the University of Wisconsin and later at the University of California, Santa Barbara. This donation was serendipitous since it happened in the centennial year of George Jusena's birth, which took place on November 2nd, 1919. Given this coincidence, Dr. Helling and I, in cooperation with Dr. Williams, decided to host this small symposium in celebration of George Jusena's prolific scholarly and literary work in his life. We've invited people who knew Sena in life, as well as Dr. Fagundis, whom I've already mentioned. Our sincere hope is that this event and the resources behind it will encourage a new generation of Portuguese studies, and particularly those interested in George Gisena's work. Again, we are grateful for your presence here today and in the other events that will take place as a part of this symposium, and we invite you to explore both the Research Guide webpage, the exhibit, and more importantly, the many wonderful resources held here in the Harold Beely Library by and about George Gisena. With that, let me introduce our uh, keynote speaker today. Dr. Frederick G. Williams is a professor of literature written in Portuguese and Spanish. He earned his PhD from the University of Wisconsin in 1971, then taught for 27 years at the University of California, first at UCLA, then, U then Santa Barbara, where he was Jorge Sena's colleague. After that, he came to BYU, where he taught for 20 years and held the Garrett de Jong Jr. Distinguished Professorship in Luso Afro-Brazilian Studies. He is the author of more than 50 articles and 11 volumes in the field of Portuguese, as well as volumes on the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, including a biography on his great-great-grandfather and namesake entitled The Life of Dr. Frederick G. Williams, Counselor to the Prophet Joseph Smith, published in 2012. Dr. Williams is a former mission president and former temp temple president. He and his wife, Carol Y. Williams, have seven children, 20 grandchildren, and four great-grandchildren. So without further ado, Dr. Fred Williams, whose talk is titled Portuguese Poet, Jorge G. Sena, the Distinguished Humanist Author and Why He is Significant Today. Dr. Williams. Thank you. The numbers have increased. There are now 21 grandchildren and eight great-grandchildren. I have to say as I begin, that this is a very special opportunity for Georges de Sena influenced my life greatly. So this is hard. In my remarks, I will be giving a panoramic overview of Georges de Sena, the man and his work and share why I believe his writings continue to be significant for us today. I will present my remarks using something of Senna's renowned style, which is always cast in a comparative context, with lots and lots of asides and digressions, filled with new information and interesting insights, not previously considered, which gives to the reader new perspectives and entices them to sink to think more clearly and act more nobly. George Sena was born 100 years ago in Lisbon and died in Santa Barbara, California on June 4th, 1978 at the young age, I can say that now, of 58. That is very young. One of the reasons we are celebrating Sena this month is he is considered by many to be the all-time third major poet of Portugal after the internationally recognized 16th century epic poet, Luis Vaz de Camões, and the internationally recognized 20th century modernist poet, Fernando Pessoa. Like them, Sena traveled widely and lived in many parts of the world. Like them, during his lifetime, he had a most difficult time 
being accepted into the literary life of the country. Like them, he experienced penury for most of his life. Like Camoens, Senna was a sailor and visited most of the lands that once belonged to Portugal's maritime empire. Like Fernando Pessoa, Senna spoke English and French and was a translator. Like Camoens and Pessoa, Senna's own poetry and prose have been translated into many, many languages, both European and Asian. It is not to be wondered that, uh, at that Senna's favorite authors were Camoens and Pessoa and that he published widely on both of them. There are some striking differences, however. Unlike Camoens and Pessoa, who were unlucky in love, Senna was a happily married man with a large family of nine children. Unlike Camoens and Pessoa, Senna was recognized during his lifetime and received many awards. And in the year he passed away, he was a strong candidate for the Nobel Prize in Literature, which, as you know, is only awarded to a living author. But there is another side to Senna missing in the first two poets. Unlike Camoens and Pessoa, Senna was a scholar and obtained not only his doctorate, but the highest university degree possible, the Libre Docencia, which comes after the PhD and existed only in France and Brazil. Unlike Camoens and Pessoa, who were unsatisfied with their life's career, a low-ranking military man in the case of Camoens, and a low-ranking contract member of the office staff in the case of Pessoa, Senna was not merely a brilliant literary author as they were, but he had a most satisfying, happy, and very influential career as an intellectual and as a professor. Senna was admired as a gifted teacher and mentor of students and faculty alike. He was recognized as a prolific researcher and publisher on a vast array of subjects. He had an encyclopedic mind due to his encyclopedic curiosity. And his influence was felt well beyond the two universities in Brazil and the two universities in the United States where he taught and occupied administrative positions. I'm going to give you a sidebar. That's my, my way of saying this is how he would do things. Senna was a student of maritime history. And one of the things he taught his students when teaching Camoens was the historical context of his epic poem, The Lusiads, which has as its framing story Vasco da Gama's world-changing travels to India. The Portuguese, Senna would explain, are the forgotten pioneers of the age of expansion, the discoverers of two-thirds of the world for Europe, the ambassadors of the West, especially its culture in Christianity, and the interpreters of the East, who for some 200 years governed the lands and controlled the riches flowing into Europe from Africa, Persia, Arabia, India, Sri Lanka, China, Japan, Oceania, and half of South America. Then Portugal lost much of its maritime empire to Britain, France, Holland, and Spain at the end of the 17th century. For example, by 1644, Holland, by force, had taken the Portuguese territories of Angola, and Son Tomé in Africa, Ceylon or Sirenka on the Indian subcontinent, Malaysia and Indonesia in the Indian Ocean, and the entire northeast of Brazil in South America. To the English, the Portuguese lost Ormuz in Arabia in 1622, and Bombay in India and Tangier in Morocco in 1665. Bombay was a forced dowry paid when Portuguese princess Catherine of Braganza became Queen of England. To the French, the Portuguese lost the northwest coast of Africa, from Morocco to Senegal. Portions of the central coast of Africa, including Ivory Coast, Benin, and French Guinea. Portions of East Africa and portions of Brazil. Niteroi, Guanabara, and Saint Louis Maranhão were established by France in 1612 and named after the same French king for whom our St. Louis is named. It is interesting to note that the capital city of Benin is still known by its Portuguese name, Porto Novo, Newport. 
And the largest city in Nigeria is, is still known by its Portuguese name, Lagos, lakes. Ceuta, which is surrounded by Morocco on three sides and the Mediterranean Sea on the fourth, is situated on the coast of North Africa. It and other Portuguese possessions in Africa were lost to Spain in the peace treaty of 1668. The Portuguese fortress is still standing and Ceuta city escutcheon is still the coat of arms of Portugal's King Manuel. And they don't even know that. A second sidebar. I've drawn comparisons between Georges de Sena and Camoens in Pessoa regarding his literary output. I should like to compare him with another Portuguese, but this time not in terms of literary greatness, but rather Sena as an intellectual with an influential scholarly career. Sena taught his students about one of the most distinguished Portuguese scholars and diplomats ever to contribute to America's growth who was even called by some of his students one of the fathers of our country. Abbé José Correa da Serra was born in Serpa, Portugal, June 6, 1750. Before coming to the U.S., first as an envoy sent to aid the country in whatever means possible, Portugal was then a first-class country and the U.S. was third. And later as Portugal's ambassador, he had firmly established his reputation all over Europe, taking his holy orders in 1775 and his doctor of laws in 1777. He was the organizer and perpetual secretary of the Royal Academy of Sciences of Lisbon, a knight of the military order of Christ, a fellow of England's Royal Society and of France's. He contributed numerous essays and publications to each of these and many more organizations. When he came to the United States, Serra was one of the, as one of the biographers wrote, quote, a sophisticated European, wise in judgment and experience and learned in the older continents, most ancient humanism and most recent science. For Correa da Serra was far more than a political liberal and Willem diplomat. He brought with him an international reputation as botanist, geologist, antiquarian, and literateur, trained in theology and political economy, as well as history and science, he hoped to employ all his talents." End quote. In the U.S., he was elected to the American Philosophical Society and the Academy of Natural Sciences of Philadelphia. Thomas Jefferson, one of his closest associates and president of the First Name Society, said of Correa da Serra after their first meeting, quote, he is the best digest of science in books, men, and things that I have ever met with, and with these the most amiable and engaging character, end quote. So admired by Jefferson was the Abbe, in fact, that one of the guest rooms at Monticello, where Serra visited early, bears his name and a large portrait still on display to this day. The correspondence between them is quite extensive. I've had the privilege of going into that room and seeing that incredible painting. After 1816, Correa da Serra was named Minister Extra Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the United States, which added to his appeal as a lecturer and dinner guest. He traveled extensively throughout the young country, studying plants, soils, and fossils, meeting with Native Americans, publishing monographs, and presenting papers at various institutions. He came into contact with the best of America's intellectuals, whom he encouraged in their work, wrote letters of recommendation, offered insights, traveled with them, researched for them, and most important of all, put them in touch with the finest minds in Europe because of his letters, they could get into the European colleges. Under his tutelage came a host of names, including George Tickmore of Harvard and writer and politician William Gilmore Sims, who Edgar Allan Poe described as the best novelist America has produced. They called Serra, quote, the restored Franklin, the American Socrates, end quote. He was offered a professional chair, professorial chair, in three American universities, 
where he continued to publish and lecture. In 1821, several years later, Jefferson wrote, quote, Mr. Correa's approbation of the plan and principles of our Virginia University flatters me more than all that the others, all of the other eulogists, because no other could be put in a line with him in science and comprehensive scope of mind, end quote. President James Monroe credits him with our naturalization laws of 1817, Judge H. M. Breckinridge with the boundary settlement in Florida. Cojea da Serra was a co-founder of the Pennsylvania Institution for the Deaf and Dumb and assisted in the preparation of the first Portuguese grammar published in the U.S., which came out before the first grammar in Spanish. A friend to four presidents and virtually all of America's intellectuals, it was with sincere regret that the, event, that the venerable Serra returned to Portugal in 1820, where he died three years later at the age of 73. Senna was a Serra kind of man and had that kind of influence. I'll not speak of Senna's literary activities in Portugal, nor his literary activities and university career in Brazil, which were very influential. I'll speak instead of his influence in the United States at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he taught beginning in 1965, and at the University of California, Santa Barbara, beginning in 1970. Senna accomplished five significant goals to grow Portuguese studies in the United States. First, he formed more than a dozen doctoral students in Portuguese studies who took their places heading up Luso-Afro-Brazilian programs across the US. I'll speak to that in more detail in just a few moments. Second, he obtained the first Portuguese lecturer to teach in the United States sponsored and paid for by the ICALP, an arm of the government. Many lecturers soon followed in the US, thus establishing Portuguese at universities that could not afford extra faculty. Third, he obtained a large grant for student scholarships and faculty research from the Calustigo Benkin Foundation of Lisbon, the fifth largest foundation in wealth in all of Europe. After his death, the foundation established the George de Sena Center for Portuguese Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara, with an additional grant of $450,000. Fourth, Sena founded an intensive eight-week summer Portuguese institute where the language, culture, and literature of the Portuguese-speaking world was taught and savored, and which also included a Portuguese house where students and many of the faculty would reside one of them, Professor Fagundes. Five, his prestige brought scholars from around the world to many conferences held in the United States, especially at UCSB, UCLA, and the University of Massachusetts Amherst. In Wisconsin, there was no Portuguese American community. Those are primarily found on the East and West Coasts. But when Senna came to UCSB, he was able to interact and become acquainted with the Portuguese American community in California, whose numbers were estimated at upwards of half a million at that time. The majority were from the Azores, also where he is from. And they dominated the dairy industry in the San Joaquin Valley and the tuna industry in San Diego. Professor Senna enjoyed associating with its members at conferences and at social events, and they enjoyed him. But regardless of the importance of his literary career on the one hand and his support of community interest on the other, Senna's major contribution to the American scene lies with his academic influence. Like his predecessor, Abe Cojea da Serra, Jorge de Senna became the mentor of an entire generation of young American scholars, educators, and writers. Wherever he taught, wherever he traveled, wherever he presented papers, contributed articles, or published books, he was firmly establishing the foundation for serious Luso-Afro-Brazilian studies in this nation as never before. Under his guidance, scores of PhDs were granted to those who later headed up Portuguese studies in an ever-increasing number of American universities. 
Tireless in his efforts, he encouraged and stimulated, both in word and by letter. He wrote virtually reams of letters. There's two volumes here of letters. There are 14 volumes published of his correspondence. Senna reviewed and critiqued works, sat on panels, discoursed, wrote, published, and in countless other ways too numerous to mention, not the least of which was the hospitality he and his equal partner wife, Messia, extended to a steady stream of international visitors who came to stay at their home each year. Georges de Senna pointed the way to excellence at every turn. When the full story is told, it may be quite unbelievable what this one individual was able to accomplish for the advancement of Luso-Afro-Brazilian studies in little more than a decade living in America. Some of Georges de Senna's literary children, Joaquin Francisco Coelho, who, who was the professor at Stanford and then Harvard, he just passed away last month. Antonio Cirujão, University of Connecticut. K. David Jackson, University of Texas, and then Yale. Daphne Patai, University of Massachusetts, Amherst. Ron Dennis, Brigham Young University. Gordon Jensen, Brigham Young University. Jack Schmidt, California State University at Long Beach. Frederick Williams, University of California, Brigham Young. Francisco Cota Fagundes, University of Massachusetts, Amherst. These are just some of them. I could share the literary grandchildren of Senna. <laughs> I'll mention two. Catherine Sanchez, who is at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, who got her degree at UCSB. And uh, another one is Christopher T. Lewis, who received his BA at BYU and his PhD at Harvard with Joaquin Francisco Coelho. And Chris heads up the Portuguese section at the University of Utah. Senna was a humanist, a critical observer of the human condition, which he chronicled in his literary and cultural output. Throughout his life, and in this he saw no contradiction, it had been his experience that along with living fully immersed in the present, he could cultivate the wisdom and learning of the past. This drive led him to become preeminent as a scholar, cultural historian, and university professor. Without becoming confessional or yet psychological, he found he could also come closer to understanding mankind by penetrating into the deepest recesses of his own being. So, and so with these two approaches, he became Portugal's leading intellectual, contemporary man of letters, poet, playwright, and fiction writer. These two avenues to human understanding from within and without were made all the more efficacious in him by virtue of his diverse formal training, scientific, military, and literary. He received a licentiate in civil engineering from the University of Oporto in 1944, and for 15 years exercised his profession, building roads and bridges for the National Highway Commission. He spent five years in the military, first as a cadet in the Naval Academy, then four years in the Army. He received a PhD in Livre Docencia in literature from the University of São Paulo in 64. This preparation in both the sciences and humanities made him an unconventional, unconventional essayist, and he brought to Portuguese literary criticism a precision and exactness rarely seen before. Here's sidebar number three. Another literary figure I will compare to Senna is Captain Sir Richard Burton, the 19th century British scholar, soldier, explorer, geographer, translator, writer, orientalist, cartographer, ethnologist, spy, linguist, poet, fencer, and diplomat, who is known for his quest to find the source of the Blue Nile, for his uncanny gift of speaking more than 29 European, Asian, and African languages with native fluency, and he's known for his daring audacity to visit the two holiest cities of Islam, Mecca and Medina, and live to write about it. And he is known for his more than 40 books, including his translation 
of the Arabian classic, The Thousand Nights in One Night, and the erotic Kama Sutra. When Captain Burton was sent to Portuguese India to recover his health, he was introduced to the works of Camões, and he read all of it in the original Portuguese, and then translated all of it into English, including the epic poem, The Lusiads. Plus, he wrote Camões' biography. Burton was fond of saying that Camões was his poet, and he carried a volume of his poetry with him the rest of his life. Burton and Senna were both in the military in faraway places in the service of the respective governments. They were both translators. They were both amateur philosophers. They were both gifted poets. They were both drawn to sexual themes. They were both included in, they both included numerous long footnotes to everything they published. <laughs> and they were both appreciated and reviled during their lifetime. I'll offer but one difference between Senna and Burton. Senna always complained of not having adequate space to do his writing, what with nine children at home. Burton, who had no children, would work on different books at the same time, using multiple desks in his spacious office at home, one for each project, so he could leave his notes, papers, and books out and not have to clear his desk. What a wonderful thing. <laughs> Burton served as the English consul in Fernando Po in Guinea, East Africa, in Damascus, Syria, in Trieste, Austria, and in Santos, Brazil. As he always did wherever he was stationed, Burton traveled and explored Brazil extensively and used his time to translate a number of her poets, including Basilio da Gama's epic poem, Uruguay. Less known is that Burton also traveled to Utah in 1860 and published a sizable book entitled The City of the Saints Among the Mormons and Across the Rocky Mountains to California, which I believe is the most comprehensive and objective work on the Church of Jesus Christ of the 19th century. He was not put off by the practice of polygamy, <laughs> having carefully studied and published on it from his travels throughout the Middle East. One of Burton's 20th century biographers was the niece of David O. McKay, the president of the church. Senna, like Gamoines and Burton, was a soldier poet that traveled the world and published widely. Like Burton, Senna made Gamoines a focus of his work and both, and both translated many other poets as well. There is even a strong church connection, as can be, see, can be seen in this conference. We've already mentioned the number that have already been involved. Two of Senna's faculty colleagues and three of his graduate students at the University of Wisconsin. Burton was born into the Church of England and was said to have converted to Catholicism when he married his wife, Isabel, who practiced her religion. But he was not a practicing Catholic and sometimes wrote like a Christian agnostic. Senna was born a Catholic, but was not practicing, although he respected all religions. He wrote poems and essays on religious writers and defended religious freedom. When Senna was in the hospital about to die, his wife asked three of his former students who represented three different religions to perform whatever rites their respective churches did when someone was about to die. She said it was her husband's request. Therefore, Catholic father, priest Alberto Huerta, a Jesuit, Rip Cohen, a Jew, and I, as a Latter-day Saint, administered to Senna. Later, it was Father Huerta that conducted the funeral in the Jesuit chapel in downtown Santa Barbara and I gave the eulogy. Senna's personal experience with the world was, like Camoins and Burton's, uncommonly broad. He lived on three continents and traveled extensively. He left Portugal and his engineering career in 1959 to accept a teaching position in literary theory in the State University of Sao Paulo. He then accepted a professorship in Portuguese at the University of Wisconsin in 1965 and again at the University of California, Santa Barbara. 
where from 75 until his untimely death at 58 in 1978, he was concurrently chairman of the Department of Spanish and Portuguese and the Comparative Literature Program. He was born in Lisbon and loved Portugal, although he was forever pointing out its foibles, which earned him his enemies. In 63, however, he became a naturalized Brazilian citizen, in part to protect himself against dictator Antonio Salazar's secret police. Asked why he remained a Brazilian after 13 years in the United States, he replied, quote, being born a Portuguese, the Brazilians don't like it. And as I was born a Portuguese, the Portuguese don't like it either. So just to irritate both, I keep the citizenship. <laughs> With such <coughs> experiences, training, insight, and native intelligence, and with the further refinement of his sensibilities through a prolonged study of the thought and culture of Western civilization. It is little wonder that Jorge de Sena was regarded as Portugal's foremost intellectual and achieved an international reputation few Lusitanians have attained. As mentioned, he was often compared to the 16th century bard Camões and the 20th century poet Fernando Pessoa. But he also had something of the 17th century cleric, Antonio Vieira. Neither of the first two had much impact during their lives. Vieira, on the other hand, was a power to be reckoned with throughout the Hispanic world on both sides of the Atlantic as a cleric, diplomat, linguist, writer, and intellectual. So it was with Senna, but comparisons can be misleading. Senna worked at no man's bidding, nor in the service of any religion, political party, or philosophy. Neither did he appreciate the preciosity often implicit in a gongeristic style. Senna prided himself on what he called his political and literary integrity. By political integrity, he meant he had not compromised himself with either the right or the left, and was free to reprove them both, and anything in between, that needed chastening, which he delighted in doing to the irritation of nearly everyone. <laughs> By literary integrity, he meant his style was his own, not borrowed, and that it had undergone few modifications from his first to his last books. Now, since the second part of my presentation is entitled Show and Tell, I will now give a more in-depth description of Semna's publishing record. And we've put up some of the things here, and I hope you will come up to look at some of that. Georges de Senna's scholarly and creative production is incredibly vast and varied, and includes such genres as biography, criticism, essay, literary history, translation, short fiction, theater, the novel, and poetry. As noted, he, pro he published on Camoins and Pessoa, he published 10 volumes on cultural and literary history and 22 volumes on literary criticism. His dedication to cultural history can be seen in the exhaustive study he made on the medieval figure Ines de Castro, and I brought one of the volumes there. At home as well in Spanish literature and culture, he brought to his Iberian studies a breadth and balance rarely seen either in Spain or Portugal as in his study of Francisco de la Torre, for example. He was one of the few Portuguese who likewise knew the international bibliographies, the ancient as well as modern text, which always situated his work in a comparative context. Besides Spanish, Italian, and French literature, Senna was well-founded in English and American literature as well. He is the author of a hefty text on English literature that was used in universities in Brazil. His output in comparative literature includes book-length essays on authors ranging from Emily Dickinson and Shakespeare to Petrarch and Mariac. Senna had had a radio program on the BBC. He had also been a music, a theater, and a movie critic, publishing his reviews in the leading periodicals of Portugal and Brazil. These are going to be kind of out of sync, but that's all right. 
As a translator, Senna published 26 volumes of prose and theater. Now this is not his work, but these are his translations, which he had translated from the original into Portuguese, written by major French, Canadian, British, and American authors, including Jean-Baptiste Molière, Graham Greene, e Evelyn Waugh, Edgar Allan Poe, Erskine Caldwell, Ernest Hemingway, Eugene O'Neill, William Faulkner. He published six volumes of poetry in Portuguese translation, including one each on Emily Dickinson, Fernando Pessoa, and Greek poet Constantin Cavafy. His magnum opus, however, is the three volumes of poetry that he collected and translated into Portuguese, written by the major poets from all over the world who wrote in various languages during the last 26 centuries. It's been published again and again. Ah, there we go. Can you hear me? This is one volume, this is two volumes, and this is three volumes. He didn't make it bilingual, so you can only read his English translation, but a, an incredible, incredible source. And like I say, uh, it's been republished, and it's a nice way to anybody look at who is important as a poet from the beginning according to him. These are all poetry that he published. Theater. Well, we'll just go off ahead. As a prose writer, Senna, Senna's own creative prose comprises nine volumes of short fiction including the classical novella O Fisico Prodigioso. I brought some of the translations in French and Chinese and all of these other. In English, it was translated The Wondrous Physician. And one novel left unfinished at his death, save for a few excerpts, and lacking its final chapter, entitled Sinais de Fogo, which he had been working on for three decades. Senna is most often admonishing the reader in everything he writes. In one short story, for example, and I'll just pick this up, he writes about the influence of Satan all over the world, and often his titles include Satan. So this is Andanzas do Demonio, and the influence that Satan has on people and why they do such terrible things. By the way, this is a book that uh, Jorge Fazenda Lorenzo and I published through the national uh, publication. Were you here when I said you were a literary grandson? Oh, very good. No, 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 you're there, you can see. Uh, we published a bibliography and there's more than a thousand items that he has published, incredible. This short story is called Defense and Justification of a Former War Criminal. Senna allows us to enter into the mind of Herr Werner Stupnein, a former SS officer, as he justifies the raping and killing of the Russian civil civilians in German-occupied territory under his control, some 20 years after World War II. Professor Jorge Monteiro has correctly identified Adolf Eichmann as the inspiration for the story, but with some important differences. In the story, Senna has both a defining subject and a moral. The subject question could be framed as follows. How can one explain or possibly understand such devotion to Hitler's theory of the master race, together with its corollary, the final solution or disposition of non-master races, by otherwise honorable, intelligent, mostly religious, and well-educated persons. The moral he hopes to instill in the reader could be summarized thus. 
this story is true and should frighten us not to death but to action for this could happen again we should be on our guard for this kind of mindset if someone can believe the notion that one race is superior to another that belief can justify a different morality any belief that places a different race religion class nationality or gender in an inferior position is aiding and abetting another holocaust we must protect and safeguard the rights of minorities here you see his poetry excuse me his theater this is his fiction And here are volumes on Camoins. On Fernando Pessoa. Culture and literary history. I love the title, O Reino da Estupidez. Here's a book on Sobre Cinema. Now, when you see Messia as the editor, it's because he had already passed away but she continued to publish what he had already written. Giadius, very interesting. He kept it, Giadius. Sorry, we're not in sync with what we were talking about, but at least you get to see it. Here are his translations. He came to know other literatures because he read their authors. And that was always one of the, one of the things he chided us on. We could talk to him about Portuguese or Brazilian literature, but he couldn't talk to us about American literature because we hadn't read our authors. <laughs> And most of these have uh, prefaces and studies that put all of this in context. These are the books of his correspondence with several different people, generally literary figures, but it also includes his wife, Messia, their love letters. <laughs> Now that's pretty courageous, don't you think? <laughs> but they had nine children, so. <laughs> Sophia Jamilo Breiner, I think I've got brought that one. Senna published 21 volumes of his own poetry. <clears throat> like Camoens and Pessoa and T.S. Eliot, Senna's poetry is in the mainstream of Western civilization, with each passage rich in allusions to our shared cultural heritage. Yet Senna is not merely a poet of thought and culture, but also of feeling and conscience and of love. With an incredible variety of meter and verse, rhyme and form, from the classical sonnet sequence to concretism. References abound in his poetry to the art, literature, music, and the history of ancient and modern civilizations. As might be expected, such allusions by one so thoroughly acquainted with Western culture 
has tended to intimidate his readers. But Seneca could do no differently. He never apologized for his erudition and did not attempt to conceal it. To the contrary, he relished it, and he loved all the arts, painting, sculpture, music, cinema, theater. He owned an immense personal library with books and records overflowing the shelves that stood from floor to ceiling on every wall and near, nearly every room in his, in his spacious home. He published two books of poetry that speak to the fine arts, Metamorphosis, which focuses on the plastic arts, and Arte de Musica, which, as its title suggests, focuses on great composers and their music. Art stimulate, stimulated him, as seen in the poem Mahler, Resurrection Symphony, where his contemplative spirit is set on fire by the beauty of the music, which in turn excites his mind with an appreciation of the grandeur and majesty of eternity. Still, he does not give himself over fully to faith in the resurrection, but is nonetheless compelled to declare belief in some future paradise. Besides culture, his major poetic themes include his homeland Portugal, political satire, social satire, the dignity of man, love, sex, death, the devil, God, and religion. Senna wrote and published three volumes of theater, one of which, when desejado Antonio Rey, the unwanted king, is considered the most significant play of the first half of the 20th century. The four-act tragedy in, in verse explores the unsuccessful bid by the prior do Crato for the Portuguese throne. It went instead to Philip II of Spain in 1580, and thus began the 60 years of the so-called Babylonian captivity, <laughs> when the crowns of Portugal and Spain were united. In Senna's last written play, entitled Epimetheus, or The Man Who Thought Afterwards, that's the brother to Prometheus, who thinks beforehand, dated from Santa Barbara, February 1971, most of Senna's favorite themes are again explored, and he includes a scathing critique of immorality, philosophy, and theology through the ages. In the play, differing supernatural belief systems separated in time and space are juxtaposed, and where regardless of the system, there is an unseen power which tempts mortals to do wrong. The play focuses on four different societies, each with their counterparts in the other and each with their own realms or planes of realities, much like Camoens dealt with the concept of dual planes in the Lusiads, mortal Vasco da Gama and the unseen classical gods, unseen by them. In the play, the action focuses on one realm and then on another in turn. The societies are, one, the pagan classical deities of Mount Olympus, second, the Judeo-Christian heaven, with angels, third, the Judeo-Christian hell with its devils, and four, contemporary man's space program with its computers, scientists, and astronauts. One of Senna's framing questions for the play might be, what are the pr principal aspirations of societies, be they ancient or modern? Senna's answer, each society is preoccupied with sex. That may not come as a surprise, except in heaven. What? A second framing question and its extension might be posed as follows. Is there a transcendental reality such as Mount Olympus, heaven, or hell? And if so, can modern scientific mortal man reach there without dying? As always, Senna's purpose is to make us aware and make us think. He asks us to consider the haste with which we trade in our old lamps of belief for new ones. This play is in part a spoof on science and technology, which have become the replacement gods. Science can be worshipped as zealously as any religion, past or present, even or especially by one who claims to be an atheist. Senna taught us that a library is like any other cemetery filled with obsolete scientific theories, philosophies, and religions. 
Here's the last sidebar. Satan, the great deceiver. Like Senna, I believe that at any one time in the history of the world, there will be several scientific theories, philosophies, and religions that answer the demands of truth. But as time goes on, new discoveries are made. Those theories, philosophies, and religions, when they can no longer answer the demands of truth, become obsolete, and new ones replace them. I also believe that Jesus Christ, when he I also believe Jesus Christ, when he said that he was the way, the light, and the truth. I also believe that behind all the contention and evil, behind all the untrue scientific theories, philosophies, and religions, is Satan, the great deceiver, plus the people who have bought into his lies, who choose greed and power over love and understanding. When all is said and done, when Satan's deceits are finally uncovered, and all the scientific theories, philosophies, and religions have become obsolete, only he, Jesus Christ, and his gospel, which, as we are taught in the temple, encompasses all truth, will answer the, the demands of truth of every kind. I love how the prophet Isaiah describes the moment when mankind will see Satan uncovered and see him for who he really is a fallen angel cast out of heaven, our spirit brother who never received a body, who rebelled against God and persuaded a third of the host of heaven to follow him, a liar who deceives, who leads people away from God and truth by so many counterfeit theories, philosophies, and religions, who fools people into thinking that he has the truth, that he is God, and gets them to do terrible things. I quote now from Isaiah. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. And notice how he says this. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? All the kings of the nations, all, even all of them, lie in glory, every one in his own house. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch, and as the raiment of those that are slain, thrust through with a sword, that go down to the stones of the pit, as a carcass trodden under feet. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial. Of course, he has no body. Because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people, the seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. That's Isaiah 14, 12 through 20. Back to the play and conclusion. Senna's play is important for a number of reasons, but for our purposes, let me restate the following. One, Senna portrays conflictive belief systems, some of them religions, one of them now obsolete, renamed mythology, and one of them scientific. Each of the three transcendent societies is unaware of the other's existence until their representatives meet on earth. Which view of reality is true? Which belief system is absolute, if any? Second, regardless of the group, of the group there is both good and evil represented among them. Three, Mortal man is influenced and tempted by unseen powers, whether emanating from Mount Olympus, hell, or a control center, and be they titans, devils, men, or computers. And four, our choices have consequences in mortality. Like Luis Vasti Camões and Fernando Pessoa, Jorge de Sena is recognized and admired as a poet. 
like Sir Richard Burton Senna has published an incredible number of books on a wide range of subjects. Like Abe Correa da Serra, Senna has influenced the growth of Portuguese studies in many parts of the world and been the recipient of several honors. In 1976, he was selected as the keynote speaker for the International Convention of Writers at Grado, Italy. Cancelled at the last minute, he would have shared the honors with three Nobel laureates, Bol, Solzhenitsyn, and Montali. He was the recipient of the Etta Taormina International Poetry Prize in 1977. He delivered the keynote address at the 1977 Camões Day celebration, which was presided over by the president of Portugal and televised nationwide. He was a member of the Lisbon Academy of Sciences, a member of the Hispanic Society of America, a commander of the Order of Prince Henry the Navigator, and a posthumous recipient of the Order of St. James. Senna, by way of summation, lived his life and pursued his career seeking and teaching truth. He fought for honesty and defended the dignity of all races and cultures. He worked tirelessly against oppression and evil at every level. And he did this most often through the printed word. Taken together, his literary output, his scholarly articles, essays, monographs, and books number well over a thousand. I should like to conclude with my own poetic tribute to Senna. It's hard to find something to say about Georges de Senna that he has not already said about himself and said much better. We have his opinion on virtually every conceivable subject and some we never conceived of before. And if he didn't treat it in a poem, a play, a short story or novel, he did it in an interview, an essay, book or letter. The best studies on Senna or by Senna. Only a Senna could appreciate a Senna. And then there are the prefaces, and the postfaces, and the nonfaces, and footnotes, and notes about the notes in every book and new edition. But even the best parody of Senna was done by Senna. And that's absolutely true. It's hard to find something to say about Georges de Senna. Thank you.